Tacita Morway is the VP of Engineering and Product at ActBlue and has previously worked at companies like Zipcar, Ditto Labs, and Salsify. With an unconventional background taking her everywhere from construction to software development to art school to web design, Tacita brings a unique perspective to the world of tech. Turn that into a, a career as a as a horse rider. Is that what they're called? Equestrian, I think. Or Equest- yeah, yeah. Equestrian. <laughs> Do you still ride or no? I wish no. I, there's um, much to my daughter's uh, chagrin. I do not. And I'm told every day that I'm a failure of a parent because we don't have a horse. You know, I do live in Medford, Massachusetts. I don't think that that would go over a well with the neighbors. Or the horse. Not too many, not too many horses around Boston. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Without a Roadmap, the podcast for tech folks who get the job done but are still figuring it out. My name is Jonas, joined here by my co-host Cameron Curry uh, and also Tacita Morway, our guest today. So great to have you, Tacita. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much. And I think just to start off our our first question of the day, to bring in a little fun fact to to those that don't know much about Tacita, um, let's talk about your your art degree and how you got that and how that's helped you um, throughout your career as both an engineering leader and a product person. Happy to. It's kind of a strange story and I will try and not give you all the details because we'd be here for a little too long. (laughs) My first degree was computer science. Um, And so right after school, I got into engineering and, uh, but I had grown up in construction. So a year in corporate America and I was like, where have I landed? What is this world I'm in? I don't speak this language. And so I, after a little while, I took a beat. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go back to what I'm familiar with and ended up in heavy machinery operating uh, as an auto mechanic in college. So wow, <laughs> there, was, there was some logic that, that got me there. Uh, and in uh, doing that work, I started missing the systems thinking of engineering, but I really liked the sort of concrete physical environment of being back in manual labor and uh, so I thought about landscape architecture, which kind of starts to marry those things. You've got this design, you've got patterns thinking, but it's here. It's not digital. It's real life plant material. Right. So I started studying landscape architecture in that school. They made you doodle all the time. If you weren't doodling, mm-hmm. someone's going to come and give you a hard time for not doodling. So you're doodling, you're sketching. And I was like, oh, wait, I kind of like this drawing thing. Maybe I should just explore that. So I applied to art school. I have no background <laughs> in painting and drawing whatsoever um, and managed to get in some place and got a degree in painting and drawing. And so I did landscape painting, figure drawing, sculpture. And uh, that's where the it started. That's how I got there. So how about we talk about a little bit how um, some of like the, the experiences is going through art school has helped you like as your career as a software engineer and also um, leading those software engineer and product teams. So one of the things in, in art school that happens um, and in the landscape architecture program is you have these critiques. So you go in there, you've been working for months, throwing up your heart and soul into these canvases and like it's a piece of you and you're putting up there in front of this panel of people who are going to tear it apart. Just like, and they're, they're going to have a great time doing it. They're going to challenge all your thoughts and thinking. And you're sitting there, you're like, oh, that's, oh, this feels great. Let's definitely do this again next time. <laughs> and after a while, you're doing this all the time. You're getting that feedback. You're getting that input all the time. You build up a muscle of uh, being okay with that and being able to carry that and not having it like you go home and you're just like, well, I am a complete waste of space and I'm really upset about myself. Like you're not being hurt by it you're being built up by it and so now you're looking for that feedback you're asking those questions and you're starting to invite that and that as an engineer is so helpful in product in anything it's so helpful to like we need to be working together that leads to better ideas that's why you want to have teams with a lot of different lived experiences they can challenge your thinking to make your thoughts better and together you work to actually have a thought partnership that results in more impactful outcomes that everybody feels good about and is participating in because you've invited other people's thoughts into your process. In art school, you have to do that all the time and have it not hurt. As an engineer, uh, I remember like one of the things that was always really uncomfortable for me was the code review. Okay, 
I've just written some code. There's probably 82 bugs. I'm sure it's not readable. <laughs> I like, I'm sure my variable names are going to make people want to throw things at me. Like you just, you know, there's all the, like, hey, please go view this. This should be fun. And again, having that muscle of like, it's okay. It's, I'm like, I'm not going to get this right. And it's okay. Like it's helpful. That's why we do this process. So it just builds up an appetite for that and a tolerance for that. I think on that point of like, it's okay to not be good in one of the things that sort of drew, drove me to painting and drawing was that I couldn't, I was never going to get it right. I'm never going to get that canvas to look the way I want it to look, the way it is in my head of what I'm ever I'm feeling. It's not going to come out right. And whatever I put there, you're not going to necessarily see and feel the same way I see and feel it. Mm-hmm. And getting used to not being right, you know, just like, it's, again, like, I have to suck at this. There's no (laughs) other options here. There's nothing I can do. And, you know, at least for myself, I think in my career, the moments that I felt most held back, it's been by my own fear of myself or when my confidence is low or when, you know, like the imposter syndrome luggage that I'm carrying around me is getting heavier. And I sort of think back to like, I didn't know what I was doing. I was painting, but it didn't stop me from painting. And I still ended up with a painting at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay, again, to not get it right and to not be perfect. I'm just going to do my best. And so those lessons, I feel like, have helped me through some of the harder moments. Um, there's one other thing that's helpful. I didn't mention when we were chatting earlier. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and there was one time where I was in a painting class, and I'm sitting there. With, it was figure painting class, so we've got this person. We've been sitting there. It's an eight-hour day. It's a really long class. You're sitting there. We're all painting, all doing our things, got our headphones on, we're in our own little worlds. And like three hours in, I had this guy's nose perfect. I mean, just like great nose. And the <laughs> professor comes over and he was like, what if, what if he got up and left right now? You've got a painting of a nose. Where's the rest <laughs> of the body? Like you've got to like get the big strokes, use the big paintbrush. So you want to be able to walk away from that canvas at any moment in time and your painting is complete. And you can keep getting more and more refined and getting it better and better as you layer on, or at least evolving, maybe not even better, but you're evolving it, but you have a complete picture at any given point. Same thing with your code. You know, like I could go and make this one piece of my code, like if I'm doing game development, right? I could make the transition between levels perfect, totally perfect. And I could just get in that rabbit hole of making this really elegant, great memory management transition, all the things are perfect. But if you can't finish the game, that transition is not super helpful. And so Mm -hmm. pulling out of those rabbit holes and making sure like I've I've used the big brush strokes, my application generally works. There's no design layer on it yet. Like all the details aren't fine tuned, but the whole thing, the framework is there and I'm just going to keep iterating on it and uh, bringing up the fidelity of that work holistically, instead of like I fixed this one part and I did this whole one part. Now I'm going to go do this whole other part. And you just get this piecemeal thing that at no point is finished. That's yeah, that's a great connection. And I, I've tying that into kind of my experience as a product person, one of the hardest things for me has been, um, you know, the big brush strokes, you know, really trying to, um, you know, take ownership and make, uh, you know, decisions that might have big impacts or kind of advocate for lines of thinking that, you know, potentially could have a big impact and just having a lack of comfort in, in something that, you know, where product might be a little bit less subjective than than artwork you could be the you know decider of that um but you know just standing up for yourself when you feel like um you do have that you know big idea but not feeling as comfortable um you know for whatever reason it you know just based on your standing at a company being you know earlier career uh and also sometimes having a lack of you know data to really drive those decisions sometimes it is a, a gut feeling so I, i'm curious just given your your position as somebody that's kind of in in the engineering and product worlds um what advice might you give to uh product folks who are having trouble kind of um making those big big strokes and, and bringing those up to the team there's some really cool things just in the question, uh, the thing about the gut feeling, it's really easy to rely on data and evidence. And it's really important to have data and evidence because that helps to mitigate bias that can show up in your thinking and decision making. But there is something really powerful about intuition in your gut and recognizing that you do have experiences in the world. Even if you're early career, you've been on this planet for a while, right? So you've had a lot of experiences. And so 
trusting your intuition and like accepting that that can be a really valid, like completely valid starting point. Um, it's a big leap, but it's like the first step of the leap to combat that discomfort. It really depends on what's causing it. So looking at what is causing this comfort, is it, is your environment healthy? Is it safe? Is there a toxic environment? That's then I want to troubleshoot that a different way. That's so like a hey, managers, HR, there's a problem here. I'm not safe bringing up my ideas and I need you all to go and y'all fix that. That's your job as managers. I'm going to keep here doing my job. Mm -hmm. If it's about just like, how do I put this idea out there that like people might not believe in and agree with me on? Uh, it goes back to that leap of faith of like, any idea is a valid one. You're paid to have them. And <laughs> right. pairing that with your curiosity, like how do you learn more about this idea? And thinking of your colleagues across the organization as thought partners. Like these, again, like, like your code, code review, like you're getting somebody else to give you feedback in your code review. I've got this big idea. Let me get some feedback on my big idea. Asking people and inviting people to come and inform it, shoot holes in it, like really challenge you on things, find the edge cases. Now they're part of this idea with you. So you're no longer alone in your idea because they've been thinking it out with you. So that's great. You're, you're got a team. Two, as a side note, you're actually cultivating a better, a stronger environment of a feeling of belonging for other people because they've now been shown, oh, that person values my perspective. They're pulling me into this. So you're also now cultivating an environment where everybody's starting to feel more comfortable putting themselves out there because you've modeled it and you've shown people, I care about your thoughts too. Mm -hmm. I'm including you in my thinking. You do belong here because I really care about your opinions here. So you're helping make the space be for the next time around easier for everybody to bring up that scary idea. So like that's just sort of first stages, but then like how, to, like what's the actual things I do? I've got my scary idea and I've actually said it out loud, but I'm still terrified that I'm gonna lead us astray and I've been given the green light, but what if I screw it up? And this was actually a terrible idea to begin with. You might, that accepting from the get-go that it might not be okay, like it might not be the right direction to go in, and that everybody around is aware that like we're going to figure this out along the way so that your expectations are set up to begin with. You've got go get clarity from your managers or any stakeholders about what risks are not acceptable. So you can start to get a sense of where the edges of risk are and stay clear of those. And then look at your idea and figure out like cataloging what are the critical components for this thing, for this like wonderful outcome to happen. Say I've reached my big blue sky idea. What are the critical components to reach that? And for each of those, like, what is, what's the smaller experiment that can give me confidence that I'm moving in the right direction? And take those smaller ex experiments one by one. And somewhere along the line with those smaller experiments, you might figure out, yeah, this is it. Like, let's go for a bigger swing now because I'm feeling mm -hmm. really good about this. Or, mm, okay, actually, JK, this is not the right direction. <laughs> We're going to step two, back. take two steps. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, one of the bigger things that you mentioned earlier with your um, experience going through art school was you developing the mindset of kind of knowing beforehand that your idea, your painting, whatever it may be, your code um, probably isn't going to be accepted the first time someone else sees it. And so I think it's also building that muscle of having that awareness that, that when you present your ideas, your code, whatever it is that you're responsible for at your job, the first time you present it, it's all about giving as much context into how you're thinking about this or why you did something in a certain way because you've been living and breathing, whatever that is you've been working on for however long time. It could be a week, month, it could be a couple months. Yeah. And so I think um, one of the bigger things probably for folks earlier in the career is um, developing the mindset that it's okay to not have all the right answers immediately at, at, the, at the gate, right? Because like you said, everyone's on the same team. We're all trying to go to, towards the same direction and we're all paid to have ideas. That's why, that's why we're hired and that's why we're contributing to the team. And so I think one thing that could be helpful for those is just how do you train that, that muscle if it's the first time you're using that muscle in the workplace, right? Because not everyone yeah. has that experience of going through art school or having some sort of experience throughout their life where they're um, faced with a lot of um, feedback early on and maybe like projection in terms of what, what they're thinking about doing because during school you're usually just given the grade and that's like all the feedback you get maybe some notes from your professor or your teacher right. like hey do this a little bit better next time you don't get that kind of face-to-face -face 
someone giving you critiques about the work you've you just submitted or shown to your to your peers good question on that because it, it is it's so hard to like find that first footing i think it depends on the environment you're in. if you were in an environment where you've got like a system of peers within the organization you're in like start that off with like okay i've got this idea who are my three trusted people in spaces that aren't like necessarily directly related to all the work i'm doing but get some some variety of perspectives and opinions and different communication styles one challenge with this approach is that we tend to build up communities of people who have similar communication styles because that's what can like make us feel comfortable and at ease so you need different communication styles you need to find the person that you can trust that's going to also be really willing to challenge you so you could start in a more uh, like a smaller space and like one-on-one that may get used to getting feedback just with this one person. Now I'm going to do it with these two people. And then I'm going to do it with two people in a room at the same time. And so you can just work your way up to people you don't work with all the time and bigger ideas in more sort of um, uncomfortable settings. There's places outside of your workplace where you can do that too. Like you could go and do the, um, you know, Toastmasters or, going out and learning some new skill anywhere, doing something like learn how to roller skate in small spaces, whatever the thing is, mm-hmm. and get used to in something that's less like, this is my career and I can't show up in a way that's gonna like show people that I don't know what I'm doing because we all have those days where we feel like that. But doing it in a safe space where it's like, there's little risk to you to put yourself at risk. Right. And um, practicing that way. And then also just, I guess, back to the workspace in the day-to-day moments, where it's not even about putting an idea out there, but it's just hearing your voice. Because depending on how early you're like, there's <laughs> yeah. times we're like, oh God, everybody else can hear me. I'm talking and my saying words that make sense. Oh, they're staring at me. I don't right, know. Right. <laughs> or like you're in, a, you're in a big meeting and all of a sudden your manager, hey, what are your thoughts on this in front of everybody for the first time? You're like, yeah. oh, so like, I wasn't I ready. <laughs> exactly. You're just like, wow, this is just a lot of silence to be making. It's a lot to cut through. Looking for places, again, like that, where it's like, okay, it's in stand-up. Do I race through what I'm saying in my stand-up? Or can I say a little bit, is this time where I could like stay, say a little bit more? Can I bring any questions to that group? Or in like planning and refinement session or grooming, whatever your team, whatever those other meetings are where it's not like I'm presenting a thing, but I'm just using my voice in a small little way. I'm going to start asking questions. I'm going to really pay attention if there's like, some kind of presentation that someone's giving. I'm gonna force myself to ask a question at the end of that. So the entire time, I'm just gonna be thinking about what's that, that question, you wanna hear the person what they're saying too, but you've got in the back of your head, what question am I gonna ask later? So you're just getting used to using your voice out loud in uh, groups of people that you might not be super familiar with. Mm-hmm. And yeah, th- for me, that group of people that you know I'm generally not super familiar with is like the engineering team. You know, communication style wise, um, you know, skill set wise, uh, and I know a lot of product folks who share a similar opinion because um, a lot of product folks are you know increasingly non technical. I, I think that you know companies are becoming more open to to hiring non technical PMs, which is great, um, but it also can be pretty stressful, especially when you already have that imposter syndrome or the kind of uh, understanding that, you know, product people should be technical. I'm not technical, but, you know, now I have to really prove myself that, um, you know, I can kind of hang in, in the technical crowd and make sure that I'm, uh, you know, proving my worth. So that I, I've, I've definitely heard that that's one of the more stressful parts of, you know, the, the product process um, for non-technical PMs. And I, I'm curious, uh, as a product you know, or sorry, a product and a engineering leader, um, it, it, you know, is there a, a general framework that you can think of uh, that, you know, product people should kind of, you know, could use um, to make their conversations with uh, their engineering counterparts uh, more productive and, you know, less stressful? Yeah, I feel like I'm sort of going back to the same concepts, actually. Um, I think if you build a relationship of thought partnership with your mm-hmm. engineering counterpart counterparts and you recognize you're all doing this work together. You just have different toolboxes, right? You just have different disciplines. There's different way you're coming up to the work and your part is different, but you're both doing the same work. Like if this thing doesn't, if this initiative isn't su- successful at the end, it's because as a team, we didn't get there. And so remembering we're all teammates and thinking of each other as thought partners and showing up with curiosity. So when you're going to talk with them, like it's okay to not understand how the full system works together and 
why is this API gonna slam this other one in a funky way? Like you, and to, to own and accept that you don't know all those things, you're not supposed to. Again, like that's not what you're getting paid. That's the engineers paid to do that. And so a lot of it comes, I think the, the nervousness can get broken down um, or eroded by building relationships outside of the data. Not like, okay, y'all got to go and be best friends everywhere. That, that's not going to happen all the time. Great when it does, doesn't always happen. <laughs> but if you build that foundation of like, okay, I know how this person likes to be asked for feedback. They know how I like to be asked for feedback. Like you get to know each other's communication needs and like communication styles and understand like, okay, well, if I'm just like really quiet while you're talking, it's because I'm listening. It's not because I'm spacing out and I'm irritated. You know, like you can have that sort of, you know, there's the manager read me's out there that everybody always talks about. And then you should have this little, like your own read me file of how it is to work with me. You can do that with your teams where you just really understand what's my operating, my mode of operation, what's your mode of operation so we can understand how those get along. And when you have that framework and you've got that familiarity, you can be like, okay, I know I will get more from this conversation with this engineer if I show up at two in the afternoon versus noon when they're eating and they're going to be really annoyed at me because I'm talking to them at lunch. And just like some of the small basic things that set the conversation up for a little bit more success starts with knowing that person and having them know you so that they also are understanding how when you go with an idea, I'm going to with an idea not because I'm wanting your approval. I'm wanting you to give me feedback on this. I'm wanting to work on this thing together and um, moving into that thought partnership relationship with them. It's a fuzzy <laughs> answer. <laughs> I think it's an interesting point you brought up, like the, the personal read me. I haven't heard, I've heard it a little bit, but I haven't heard too much more about that. Would you uh, mind sharing, just giving some details about what all goes, goes into that, that read me that you just mentioned for our listeners? Yeah, there's a um, whole, I, will, I would encourage you to anyone to go and look up like personal read me files, because there's so many different formats and structures around it. Um, some of the things that I find to be most helpful is like, uh, around communication mechanisms. Do I, mm -hmm. is it Slack? Is it email? Is it the time of day? Do you, I want you to like get on a Zoom call with me? So understanding the mechanism of communication that works best and is most comfortable. Understanding what frustration looks like. Like if I'm stressed or frustrated, this is how it's going to show up so that people are aware and don't take that as like, you're annoyed with me. I just know you're having a, you're having a day. You go, power yep. to you. I hope you feel better tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, it happens uh, to everybody. <laughs> it happens to everybody. <laughs> this is like increasingly important with the rise in remote work because um, it's impossible to um, you know, discern tone uh, over a Slack message. And yeah. um, I think that that's kind of the crux of a lot of, um, right. you know, lacks of communication or, um, you know, issues with communication. Yeah. Like, especially like being remote, like you said, because your dog could throw up in the other room and you could have no idea that that, that, that just happened. Yeah. And, but now you got a meeting in two minutes. You got to, <laughs> you got to yeah. talk to folks about. <laughs> totally. And like, and having in those conversations, like whether it's through a readme or just like talking to a person, you can dive into some of those details and you can start to get them to know, like to know them a little bit more like, okay, I have a better picture of the world you're working in. And, and like, uh, one of the things that when communication starts going funky between engineers and product managers or engineers and designers or product managers and designers, it's our cadence of work can be very different. As an engineer, you're like, I am in the zone. You can't make noise in the same zip code as me. Like just please, I just don't, don't interrupt the world I'm in right now because I, I like, holding together that sort of like a 3D puzzle. And if it falls apart in my hands right now, because you asked me about some weird PM thing, I'm going to freak out at you. <laughs> and so getting up front from people, like what are the moments where it's disruptive and how do I know when it's going to be disruptive to, to engage with you? Cause that's when like you get that sort of like an engineer showing up and not wanting to hear all the questions or not having patience or whatever the thing is that are like the typical, there's so many memes about it all the time, right? Like uh, how do you, just acknowledging those pain points and then having proactive conversations like here's the places we can trip up because we might, because this is what happens in the industry and I see it all the time, or maybe because I've experienced it with you and just having that direct conversation 
and making sure people's expectations are set and saying, I don't like, I don't know engineering. I don't know all the tech stuff. And I, that's where I need to depend on you. I'm going to bring in the end user story. I'm going to bring in the business value story. I'm bringing in the why of what we're doing. I need you to bring in the technical stuff and just really like being okay that we're not going to know all the same things. That's by design. Mm -hmm. You brought up like the, the why of like why we're trying to work on this initiative, whether that's, I think that applies to whether you're working with an, a designer or engineer. Um, Cause I, I've, I've, I feel like there's some kind of like a misconception with being a product person is that you have all ideas, you, you present your ideas and the team like has to work on them. Whereas in reality, you should always be presenting like the why things are important to work on. And yeah. then, like you said earlier, forming that thought partnership with all the different internal folks you work with, engineers, designers, other product managers, like marketers, salespeople to kind of come to the solution that's going to best fit or best move the direction of the product or the company in the, in the right way. Yeah. And that's where you get all the motivation. People get pumped behind the thing. Exactly. Exactly. So it's more like kind of campaigning for like an idea. Almost. Totally. <laughs> totally. <laughs> like this is why this is important. This is the people that are going to be benefited from it if we do build it. And this is how like it can eventually help our business or move us in the right direction of where we're trying to take the product. And so I, I think that's probably the biggest thing I've learned over the last two years is, become more of like a, a campaigner for, for certain ideas because um, Jonas knows that our CEO is heavily opinionated. And so when you bring up an idea, you have to come ready with the facts and come ready to, to, to debate all the different points he's going to critique you about your idea. <laughs> like that art critique, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, to, to kind of switch gears though, to kind of go to our, our last um, topic of the day, um, which is probably most relevant for Jonas and I right now, as we were looking to, to scale a parlor and build out some different um, engineering and, and product teams, is how you structured your, your product and engine teams in the past and what has worked best for you and your personal experience. I think it's having, we've been talking about the stop partnership thing. And so having teams that represent, you've got the product manager, the engineering manager, the engineers, the designer, maybe the research QA, whoever, whatever the disciplines that you are, you have an interdisciplinary pod. That squad, that team, whatever you want to call them, they're in the day-to-day -day work together. So it's not like you've got your product team and your engineering team. You've got this interdisciplinary team that has different perspectives, building out diverse teams that have different lived experiences coming in because then you're going to have different troubleshooting, different communication, different like all, all the variety that you need to make ideas stronger and get people um, feeling safe having a voice in the space. And that's how we then talk and can have successful thought partnership. So you have these, these interdisciplinary teams with domain areas of focus and trying to think about how those complement each other, being aware of when they're gonna clash against each other and overlap, whether it's code base or same similar users, whatever the thing is, knowing that up front, because there's no way to, you don't actually want to fully silo things. You wanna have spaces where things have to touch uh, to help combat the silo piece. Mm -hmm. Additionally, having, while you, like people sort of their main home base is in these interdisciplinary squads. You also have like the designers meet on a regular basis, the product managers meet on a regular basis. So you have that other team that's your discipline focused team. So you're exchanging ideas, you're learning from each other um, about your discipline and your craft, which is less, more about that and less mm -hmm. about the, necessarily about the actual work. Um, some folks on our team have started these uh, working groups, these cross uh, team working groups. So when there's something like got something we need to upgrade across the system or there's some new tooling we want to build, we get people from all the different product teams will come together and do an initiative that's separate from their main focus of domain. And that again helps break down the silos. So looking for all those opportunities where you, you've got not necessarily organizational structure in place to make sure people are interacting with people all over the engineering product team, but you've got some just practices and sort of cultural environment that promotes that connection. So you don't end up with these product team silos across the way. How do you, um, question about the, the overlap, how do you kind of address that up front and kind of acknowledge that, hey, these two teams at some point, either whether it's the code base or like features that are gonna touch both areas of the product or both teams, how do you acknowledge like how that's that portion of the work is going to operate or like do you just have the teams kind of figure out themselves and say hey whatever works for us for for these two teams to work together to get this one feature or this major product initiative out because there, there's going to be overlap um we'll let you self-organize and 
and figuring it out yourselves? Well, for better, or for worse, I'm, I tend to be the, you do you and holler at me when you need help. Like, <laughs> uh, but the, so when we, when I first got to ActBlue, we, we totally restructured and reorganized people's areas of focus and caught, like in as part of that process, just called out like, you two teams over here, you're going to hate me because you're going to crash up in these ways. And you two teams over here, you're going to hate me because you're like, there will be frustration. Let's own that up front. Let's lay, name that up front and look out for it and start to figure out where the boundaries are um, and where, where they get fuzzy so that we can start, we can be really aware when uh, we're working in an area that's starting to get into this other space. And so that we make sure that we proactively communicate. It doesn't always happen. We definitely like, we fall down sometimes and, some team will go ahead and do a thing, not realizing, oh, wow, yeah, that is going to have impact over there. Being okay when those trip ups happen is also important and just adjusting. Like, okay, let's, we caught that, our bad. Let's, here's what we were intending to do. Let's figure out how not to do this next time. And right. just letting that conversation happen. But we also, I mean, so, some simple, you know, just quarterly planning, you know, having, being really not just transparent about the work you're planning to do, but actually making it visible, like going mm -hmm. and making sure people are looking at the thing that you posted and that people are actually reading it, asking questions to ensure that they're actually reading and looking at it <laughs> yeah. so that you don't find like, oh, we wanted to do this thing this quarter, but we were relying on ops and ops meanwhile is doing 17 other things and they just didn't have time to actually read our quarterly plan. And, right. and now they're like, that's cute that you want to do that. We're like migrating between <laughs> Getting ghosted in the workplace, it's a big yeah. pain. <laughs> yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, this has been super helpful. Uh, you've dropped a lot of knowledge bombs on us, things that are really important to us now as we're, you know, planning to, you know, grow the team in a couple of different areas. So we really appreciate all of, uh, all of your insights and your time. And uh, we didn't even get to get into, you know, any of the exciting stuff that you're doing at Act Blue, which, you know, probably deserves its own episode. So for those of you who <laughs> aren't aware, <laughs> definitely check them out. Any, any, any last words you'd like to share with our group? It could be a selfless promotion uh, or just anything you'd like to share with the audience. Say, uh, take care of yourself. <laughs> it is a rough time out there. And yeah. uh, so I hope people are finding fun, finding space and like pacing yourself. We've been talking a lot about sort of the, the fear and the tension and how to work through challenges in the workplace. And that can be really exhausting and recognize that sometimes it's okay to get tired and be like, you know what, I'm going to take a three day weekend and I'm just going to chill out. And I'm going to go do something that makes me feel really good and confident and build myself. And then like, I can go back and face this and just get your support networks in place. Cause we're all, it's been a, it's been a rough ride. As a <laughs> yeah, yeah. It has been. <laughs> Take care and have as much fun as you can. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for everyone listening. And for those that are still listening, make sure you like and subscribe so that our wonderful marketing person doesn't yell at me. <laughs> <laughs>